This is great. So um, this is my very, very first RailsConf. Um, in a full disclosure, I have never, ever shipped a line of Rails code in my life. Um, I am a total outsider. But I came to this conference. I came to the whole thing. I went to lots of really, really great talks. I got to meet lots of really, really great people. It was really uh, a really welcoming community. I'm really glad I came. And I've learned uh, a, a few key words that I need to study on, like something like active record. Um, something turbo or turbo something. Um, and apparently you folks are into this thing called testing, which I, I've never had to do. So, uh, so, so um, I'm Paul Amir. I work at uh, Spotify, a music streaming service. Um, and I'm really excited about this talk because I get to talk about my two very, very favorite things. One is music and one is code. Um, so let's talk a little bit about music. So when, when I was in high school, I was in a band. It was the Memorial High School Marching Band. And I played trombone, and I really loved about, um, uh, being a musician. I loved getting in front of people. I loved to uh, you know, share uh, a performance. I loved to maybe even be able to touch people emotionally with you know, power or, or make them feel maybe sad because of the sad trombone or something. Um, but I, I sort of realized, first of all, I was not really that good. I could not make a, a career as a, uh, as a trombonist. So I moved on to become a programmer. Um, this is back in the early 80s. This is what it looked like to write code in uh, 1984. Uh, oscilloscope, that's me wearing a tie. And you notice um, I'm, uh, a tie actually makes me look a lot slimmer. Um, so I spent 20 years or so writing uh, all sorts of software in, in lots of different industries, including, funnily enough, uh, the industry that Nicholas was talking about. I wrote software that controls the cameras that are flying in the U2, and they're actually still flying to this day, much to my shock and horror. Um, <laughs> But um, about 15 years ago, I got to combine the streams, my, my two very fa favorite things, code and music. I started to work in, in, the, in the music tech industry. And uh, eventually that led me to uh, working at Spotify. And so now I'm in this total heaven because I'm surrounded by all of this, these awesome people who are building this awesome product, uh, but I, m even better, I'm surrounded by all this great music data that lets us uh, learn about how people actually experience music. Um, so this talk is called Data Mining Music, but that's just so you can go back to your bosses and say, yeah, we, we learned about data mining. It's really uh, hacking on music, because that's what I do. I like to uh, explore music through code uh, in all sorts of different ways. I like to find out um, how people experience music, uh, I like to think about how people can learn about music. I like to uh, make the music experience more interesting, more interactive, um, and do the, all sorts of things like that. Now, my real job at Spotify is to spend every day looking through all this data and try, trying to improve the music listening experience for our listeners. And so that may be things like helping them find a little bit more about uh, the music itself or help their organize their music collection or give them good music recommendations. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to show uh, 14 examples of really kind of hacks, but I call them experiments because that's better than hacks. Um, uh, that show different ways that we can uh, learn stuff about music. So um, one of the things about uh, Spotify is we're surrounded by data. And the data that we uh, get at Spotify about how people are listening to, to music gives us a view of uh, music listening that we've really never had before. Um, and I'm just going to dive right into a, a quick example to give you a taste of this. And this is called the Aerosmith Anomaly. So you guys, I'm sure, are all familiar with Aerosmith. They're the bad boys from Boston. They had their first hit way back in 1975. But I'm sure most of you are most familiar with their, their only number one hit, which happened in 1998. That was, it's the song, um, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the song, but you guys know what it is. This is what it sounds like.
first spontaneous applause I've ever received in a talk. <laughs> so um, that um, some of you may have actually that uh, that may have been uh, your very first slow dance in middle school. I should have given you a trigger warning. Um, <laughs> so. so well, one of the things, because we know exactly when people play, uh, play this song on Spotify, we can look at a time series of this song. So here's uh, the track of streams as a function of time for, for Don't Want to Miss a Thing over about a two-year period, uh, from January of 2013 to December 2014. So you notice a few things about this plot. One is, uh, you know, there's this general slope up to the right, and that's not because the song's getting more popular, that's because Spotify is getting more popular. Um, you also see a lot of these little bumps, and that's uh, the weekly listening pattern. So during the week, people listen to more when they're at work, and they listen a bit, little bit less uh, during the week, and that's a pattern pretty common across all songs. But the really interesting thing, and this is the Aerosmith anomaly, are these peaks. What is causing these peaks? We have, uh, um, so we see some peaks that the, the volume of listening is doubling or tripling in, in what looks like a single day. I mean, this actually is pretty rare. We don't see this across any other song. So what is causing this? So we can start off by taking a look at the dates. All right, so, <laughs> right. February 14th, February 14th. So you're thinking middle school dance, right? But then what about this August 7th, 7th, September 18th, and November 13th? Well, it turns out uh, these are all, um, uh, these spikes are here all for the same reason, and it's not because of Valentine's Day. Uh, it's for another reason, and it's uh, actually, it's an unworldly reason. So take a look. This first one, this close shave with asteroid 2012. <laughs> Potentially hazard at asteroid, this is the Earth. Rosetta spacecraft orbits Comet 67P. Filet landing site selected on Comet 67P. Robotic lander touches down on 67P. <laughs> hey, we're a team, too. <laughs> Spontaneous. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, you guys have totally figured this out, right? This song was on the soundtrack for the movie Armageddon where Bruce Willis goes and saves the world from, um, from uh, a comet that's about to hit the earth. So what we found out is this song is sort of the poster child. This is the go-to song when there's some kind of asteroid or meteor coming our way. <laughs> so and this is the kind of thing... We never, ever would have found out if we looked at, um, you know, the, the old traditional chart. So here's Billboard, um, and before uh, the digital music revolution, uh, people would go to Billboard, and Billboard would actually call record stores and call radio stations to find out how often people were playing songs. And so um, we look at how much more data, how fine a, a view we have of the data. It's, it's kind of akin to with Galileo. <laughs> It's kind of akin to when Galileo took his telescope and pointed at the sky the first time and he saw the moons of Jupiter or, or the rings of Saturn. Um, you know, it's maybe not as, has had such a big global impact as this, but it's the same sort of thing. Certainly a big impact in the music industry. Uh, the data that we, we see here um, is just uh, opening up our eyes to all sorts of ways of how people are listening to music. Um, but before we leave this example, just one more thing. Uh, I know you guys know that uh, correlation does not necessarily imply causation. So if you go back to that, that chart with the Aerosmith thing, just sort of think maybe what if the, the correlation thing is actually reversed and increased Aerosmith listening <laughs> is actually attracting <laughs> asteroids and meteors. Now think about it. <laughs> no, really. All right. So why do we care? Why do we care that we have lots of music data that lets us find strange things about music? Well, back to when I was first writing that code, this, this was our uh, exciting new music technology, the uh, Sony Walkman. You could put 10 songs in your pocket, really big deal. The biggest challenge was actually trying to get that to fit in your pocket. Um, and 20 years later, Steve Jobs got on stage and introduced the first iPod. You could put 1,000 songs in your pocket the exciting technology that went with this was shuffle play. You could shuffle through 1,000 songs and get a pretty good listening experience. 
Um, and then 10 years later, Spotify launched in the US and lots of other streaming services did as well. They essentially put 30 million songs in your pocket. So you're essentially a tap away from listening to just about any uh, song that has ever been recorded, except for Taylor Swift. Um, <laughs> it's true. Um, and so um, we're gonna need help figuring out how to uh, listen to music. Uh, when you have 30 million songs, you can't hit the shuffle play button because you're going to get some John Philip Sousa march and some Gregorian chant and some Keisha, and you're going to get iPod whiplash. Right? So uh, we need tools to help this. So we have 30 mil million songs in our pocket. What are we going to do? So this is what I do at Spotify. I try to figure out how to improve the listening experience. So in this talk, I'm going to sort of walk through 14 experiments around how we can uh, better engage the listener. And every, we're talking about this is all about data. So I'm going to focus on four different kinds of music data. Uh, music metadata, so this is the basic facts about music. Cultural data, so this is what people are saying online about music. There's listener data, so this is uh, who's playing what and when. And finally, acoustic data, so this is treating the music as data itself. So what does the music actually sound like? So we're going to start off with music metadata, sometimes called the most boringest of the music data. Um, so this is really the basic facts. Uh, we, you know, Spotify, we have millions of tracks, our, uh, artists and albums, and they're all interlinked. Artists have albums, albums have tracks, tracks can appear in multiple albums. So there's a crazy intertwining of all these things, and they ha have lots and lots of, of different facts associated with them. Um, and it turns out that this is really, really hard because uh, the music space is not really well contained. Artists can call things whatever they want. They can do whatever they want and nobody can stop them. And so uh, it turns out that uh, we spend a whole lot of time trying to get this data right. And I'm just gonna give you an idea of some of the challenges here. So first of all, you know, here's a simple music query. Somebody says, hey, what are the songs on the album White Christmas by Bing Crosby? The reason that this is hard is actually Bing Crosby has 40 albums called White Christmas. <laughs> and they all have different album art, they have different tracks, they have different performers. So he had the cow called White Christmas and he kept making sure he could milk it every year with a, with a new album. Um, so um, Sarah had told me that this is a really highly technical crowd and that I should try to challenge you as much as I can. So I have a little math quiz here. <laughs> So why is this formula troublesome for music recommendation and discovery? Just shout out the answer if you know. Huh? 42. Yeah, all right. All right, no. All right, the answer is, this is the name of a song by Aphex Twin. <laughs> so if you're building a music service and you want to make sure that your listeners can find this song, what do you do? There's, there's, it's not easy. So just... Um, we kind of look at uh, artist names, right? Back before we had Google, we had a band called The The who made their name out of stop words. I'm, I know you guys are all familiar with the band Duran Duran, but you, did you know there's a band called Duran Duran Duran? <laughs> and there's a DJ who calls himself DJ Donna Summer. Um, and there's Glass Teeth. And in fact, there's a whole genre called Witch House, which is just filled with uh, uh, non-pronounceable names. And then the final artist, which is an artist that, as far as I can, can uh, be concerned, be burned in hell forever, is the artist named Various <laughs> Artists. There, there really is a DJ whose name is Various Artists. <laughs> um, so, say you're a fan of the band Eclipse. Did you know that there's actually 22 bands called Eclipse? Now, if you happen to be the fan of the Utah-based vocal choral group, and I happen to play for you the Ukraine brutal death metal grindcore <laughs> version of Eclipse, both of us are going to have a bad day. <laughs> All right, so music metadata, it's hard, um, but, um, but we can still try to have a little bit of fun with it. So um, for we want to do for our first experiment, we're just going to put our toe in the water, a little bit of data is to answer a very important question from the internet. And the question is, have band names been getting longer? And this is a real question that's been posted on Quora. And so helpfully, uh, this guy named Zachary Davidson, he starts off by giving us his qualifications, which are, I named both my bands. <laughs> and he says, 
he would say, yes, they are getting longer, but only very gradually. And he goes on and on and on sort of justifying his things. But of course, that's his opinion. We're just going to do this with data. Um, and so it's pretty easy to do. Um, it's the uh, only thing we have to do is go through the top 500 artists for a five-year window, blah, 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 calculate the average names, and we're done. And uh, the code is actually shorter than Zach's answer. <laughs> so... Have band names been getting longer? Little audience participation. Raise your hand if you think uh, artist names now are longer than they were a long time ago. Okay. Raise, raise your hands. Okay, keep your hands up. If your hand's up, you are wrong. The artist names were actually longest in 1955 to 1959. You say, well, what was going on then? Because they were quite a bit longer. Um, these are the kinds of band names we had back then. Dan McCoy and the Soul City Symphony Orchestra, Academy of St. Martin's. So essentially the, 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 the meme at the time was orchestra leader name plus orchestra name. So we ended up with very long names. And of course, while we're at it, we might as well take a look at what the, um, what the longest artist names are ever uh, that were uh, popular. And the longest is uh, Tim and Sam's, a Tim and Sam band with Tim and Sam. I think Tim and Sam both grew up with short names and they compensated. <laughs> All right, so that's a quick tour through metadata. Now we're going to, to cultural data and you probably uh, may know less about cultural data because no one else, I don't know, whatever. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so cultural data. So, so the idea of cultural data is there's lots of data out there on, on the web where people are writing about uh, music. So there's music blogs, there's uh, music review sites, there's people are putting playlists together. Um, there's lots of lots of really interesting data. So the idea is let's go out, crawl all this data, sort of a Google scale crawl, collect it all up, do some uh, natural language processing on it, uh, statistics on it, and use that data to give us a really good description of uh, particular artists. So uh, here's a, an example. So we have this uh, uh, black metal band, Dimu Borgir. Here's a typical review that you'd see for a band. You can see there's actually lots of descriptive words for, for this uh, artist. So black metal, melodic black metal, uh, unique, symphonic, Norwegian, fast, famous. Um, so we, when we start to collect all these words up, we get a pretty good idea of what this band is, is about. And this is just from the words from the first paragraph of one review. So if you repeat this over thousands and thousands of reviews that have been written about this band, collect up all the words, find the ones that are distinctive for the band, find the ones that appear a lot, we get a really good description of what this band is. And we can use this uh, data for all sorts of things. But one of the things that we use it for is for... Uh, artist similarity. So we can find out how similar two artists are. So we got Katy Perry, we have Dimmu Borgir, we can look at their top terms, and here I'm only showing a half dozen terms, but imagine that these lists go on and on and they're weighted in all sorts of crazy ways. Um, there's very little overlap, essentially the decades that they, that they played in. Um, whereas we look at a, a different artist, like, say, Britney Spears, uh, quite a bit of overlap with, with Katy Perry. So we can sort of assume that Britney Spears and Katy Perry are, um, are, are very similar. All right, so now we're going to do an experiment with this artist similarity. And it's, uh, the experiment is to expose a listener to new music by using this artist similarity. But this is the extreme edition, and it's extreme because our goal is to help a Katy Perry fan... Listen to Dimo Borgir. <laughs> All right. So how are we going to do this, right? So we start off, we have these two artists. We know that they're very, very uh, dissimilar. But maybe we can find an artist that, that fits in between, um, that has some overlap with both of them, right? So here we have a, a, maybe a three-song playlist that would get us there. But that's a pretty big jump from Katy Perry to Evanescence and st also a very big jump from Evanescence to Dimu Borgir. So we have to go a little further. So in fact, what we do is we can take all of the artists, put them in a big graph, uh, and connect them all up to their nearest neighbors. And this is a visualization that was done by researchers at Yahoo, by the way. It's pretty nice. Um, so when we see Katy Perry is at one end of, of the space, Dimu Borgir is at the other, Evanescence is nicely in the middle. But what we want to do then is just sort of fill in the gaps calling our friend Dijkstra to find a path through uh, this space, and uh, we have a playlist. So, uh, and so there's an app that does this. It's called Boil the Frog.
All right. You guys are way ahead of me. You know the story about boiling a frog. You put a, uh, a frog in cold water and heat it up uh, uh, very slowly. It won't notice. It will jump out. The idea is to do this musically. So take somebody who's listening to music, very gradually take them from one artist to another. So um, I'm going to uh, run this generator playlist, and we'll listen to very brief snippets of the 10 songs. And the idea is there should be like gradual pro progression um, between the songs. Here we go. Katy Perry. Dimu Borgir, Boil the Frog. We got a playlist of 10 songs, so let's listen. We're gonna have audio, I hope. Here it comes. So that's Boil the Frog. <laughs> All right, so that's our quick tour through cultural data. Um, now we're moving into listener data. So listener data, this is, you know, every time you press play on Spotify, we get a little uh, message that says, hey, uh, you play this song, uh, this Geisha song, uh, this date. And so we get uh, billions and billions of, of this data every day. And it's really sort of the bread and butter of Spotify. We dry, derive all sorts of things from the data, this data, from charts and music recommendations and collaborative filtering and stuff like that. Um, but I'm going to try to talk about something that's maybe a little future uh, looking and uh, it's something I'm really interested in and that's finding artists that have really passionate fans so um, you know there's uh, there's you know the certain artists are there any Hamilton fans here by any chance right so Hamilton fans they listen to that album over and over and over and over again am I right Yes. All right. Yeah. And so they're um, um, very, very passionate. I think finding artists that have passionate fans is really interesting. If you're helping people find music and you can steer them to a pas uh, an artist that they become really passionate about, uh, I think it's a, a, a big win. So what we want to do is see if we can find the artists that have the most passionate fans. And we'll sort of bucket this and say, is it, uh, which, which type, which genre has the most passionate fans? Is it dubstep or is it metalheads? Right. So, how are we going to find out how uh, how uh, how passionate uh, the fans are for a particular artist? And there's probably lots of ways to do it, but one really simple way is to just look at the, sort of the average number of plays per fan uh, for a particular artist. And so we can sort of illustrate this. These numbers are fake. I don't mean to disparage any artists here. Uh, so here's two artists with a million plays. Uh, uh, Robin Thicke on the left, he has 200,000 fans, which means every fan is playing his, his song five times. So Blurred Lines made it into the playlist, they play it five times, and that's it. Whereas on the other side, we have Lord, and uh, she ha has 10,000 fans. Uh, and each of those fans are playing her songs 100 times. So uh, obviously those fans are much more engaged than Lord, so she has these high passion fans. So same number of plays, different number of fans. Uh, we can say uh, which artist has highest passion fans. So we can do this for lots and lots of artists. Here's a plot here. Uh, X-axis is the number of fans. Y-axis is the number of plays. And we can sort of see, you know, most artists follow the same general arc, but we have some artists that uh, have really high number of average plays per listener, and there's some artists that have low. So to answer our question, which uh, artists have the most passionate fans, we can just look for, for the artists that are in the, the top here. Um, and so, 
Here's the question. Who has the most passionate fans? Raise your hand if you think uh, it's, uh, so the choices are dubstep or metal. Raise your hand if you think it's metal. Have the, and do the salute too. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, all right, all right. It's a pretty good number, right? All right, so who has the most passionate fans? So the artist with the most passionate fans is a band called In Flames with 115 plays per fan. All right, yeah? Yeah, see? Keisha fans wouldn't clap. Uh, I didn't mean to pick on Keisha. Taylor Swift fans wouldn't clap. Oh, they would. I'm sorry. Uh, so, so here's In Flames. They sound like. Right? That's pretty good. You can see why they have the passionate fans. So if we look at the top 20 artists, nine out of the, the top 20 are, are metal bands and zero are dubstep. So indeed, metal heads are the most passionate fans according to this one small experiment. All right, so who has the least passionate fans? There's one band that stands out. They have only five plays per fan. Who could it be? And so they, they're sort of this one-hit wonder band. They have a song that's in thousands and thousands and thousands of playlists. Everyone listened to, like, old guys like me when they go running. And, um, <laughs> um, but then you never listen to anything else. So they have a pretty low uh, um, plays per fan. All right, so that's a quick tour through the, the Passion Index. All right, so playlists. You know, at, at Spotify, in the last 10 years, people have created 2 billion playlists. That's a huge amount of data. Uh, oh, I sound like Trump, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the, the question here is, what can we learn from, from 2 billion playlists? Um, and so one of the things we can do is just look at the most frequent names of playlists. So we look through all these 2 billion playlists, find the most frequently occurring names. And these are the top 10. So we have rap, chill, country party, house, workout, rock, gym, music, and road trip. So it's kind of funny people make playlists called music. Uh, lots and lots of people make playlists <laughs> called music. But you notice here, you know, five, five of them are, are genre-related. Five are not genre-related. They're, they're context. So people are actually making playlists around what they are doing as opposed to the type of, of music that's in the playlist. So if you look at the top 100 playlists, 17 of the, the, uh, of the top 100 names of playlists are genre-related, and 41 are context-related. So this leads me to believe context is really the new genre. So um, people are organizing their listening around, oh, I'm going for a run, or I'm having a, a dinner party, or uh, I need to, some focus music. So just to give you an idea of some of the names that people are using when they're creating playlists, here's a wall of words, but they're bucket, bucketed into different sections, like training and workout, um, you know, lots of different types of playlists. We have mood, uh, relax, motivation, 420. Uh, <laughs> we have travel. Road trip on the fly, commute fly, yeah. We have romance, <laughs> love. We have time, 420. <laughs> Focus, All right, 420 should be highlighted there. <laughs> Apologize for that. All right, I, actually I was talking to uh, some uh, Rails guys uh, from Weed Mapper. Yeah, yeah. We had this great idea, uh, uh, sort of a joint effort Spotify weed mapper playlist thing. <laughs> All right. Socializing. Yeah, party, dance, free game, 420. So lots of different ways people are organizing their music. So context is really, really important, but context is really, really hard uh, because your, our music does not come pre-labeled with the context that it's good to listen to. So our challenge here is to let's find music for a particular context by mining tracks from these two billion existing playlists. Um, and so, uh, you know, to put it very specifically, let's see if we can create a play playlist of mainstream tracks that are good for running for a 55-plus-year-old male like, like me. Um, all right, so how are we going to do this? Well, here's the app, but um, we'll just look at what we do. Um, we have two billion playlists. We start, we just start by searching for all the playlists that have running in the title. Um, we may get about 10,000 of those playlists. Um, we aggregate all the tracks from them, so all the tracks that occur in those 10,000 playlists, some are going to occur a lot more than others, so we aggregate them up so that the tracks that appear the most in all those playlists go to the top. We sort of adjust for popularity so that uh, distinctive running tracks uh, come to the top. And then we can filter these by demographics uh, so that tracks that are uh, more likely listened to by a 55-year-old get re-ranked higher. 
And this leads us to a playlist. So here's uh, the 55-year-old male running playlist. Um, so uh, here's what it sounds like. <laughs> So that, that movie, Rocky, came out in 1975, so all the 55-year-olds watch that when they're 16 years old. It's still their big go-to running song. Um, so since we're doing this nice demographic filtering, we can generate the same playlist, but targeted for an 18 to 24-year-old female. And um, we get a much different set of tracks. Uh, we can hear what they sound like. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger Right, so um, uh, you notice that the, the tempo is much higher for the female, the 20, 18, 24 year old, than the male. Uh, so we have a few others. We have road trip tracks. Here's a road trip track. Uh, whereas a, a young woman would listen to. Uh, sexy time. Turn the water. Shade off. So I sort of uh, back myself into a corner here because I have three 18 to 24-year-old daughters. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to play the first song from the next playlist. You can read the titles. I don't even want to know. All right. Enough of that. <laughs> they can make their own decisions. All right, so after sexy time, it's breakup time. You notice the men, it, it's all about the crying. Hear that, you're mine. All right, whereas the 18 to 24 year olds, it's all about the FU. We got along, we got along, we got along until you turn down. Now all I want is just my stuff back. All right. So, quick tour, mining uh, playlists. Um, fun thing is, uh, we're rolling this kind of thing out into Spotify. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to get good playlist uh, recommendations based on things like titles real soon. Um, all right, experiment number five, perhaps one of my favorite experiments of all, and this is using scrubbing data to find the best parts of a song. So, people listen to music, uh, they oftentimes not only just press play, but they actually scrub inside the song. They'll uh, move and play the best part, or they'll skip the worst part of the song. So what happens if you aggregate this data across millions of millions of people who are listening to the same songs? Well, you start to get a, a map of what are the hot spots in the song, the best parts of the song. So here, um, sort of blow this up, here are the most common uh, uh, places that people are scrubbing to in uh, this song, In the Air Tonight, by Phil Collins. Now, um, um, people actually don't scrub to the, their favorite parts. They usually scrub a little before that. So if we sort of integrate the actual listening part, we get another curve. And that shows us the most listened to parts of the song as a, uh, as a result of scrubbing. So you guys probably figure out what this is going to sound like. But let's listen anyway. We're going to start at the most scrubbed to spot. And we'll listen through the actually most listened to spot. And we need the volume up just a little bit on this example. Very good. <laughs> So, um, so a lot, a lot of times they do these experiments, you get some interesting results, but this, these results just pop. You look at like a dubstep song, a dubstep song like this. The, uh, the, the, that peak, that very, very sharp peak, it's, it's the drop. So. So it really turns into a, this really awesome drop detector. <laughs> Which is, we, the world needs this, because who wants to listen to all that, right? You just listen to, to this bit. All right, a couple more examples. I'm going to wait till the beat go in. Play his head. 
you sort of imagine millions and millions of people scrubbing to the exact same spot. <laughs> Unicorn Zombie Apocalypse. Right, so that's pretty awesome, but there's more. So uh, because we can look at the shapes of this, these peaks, some peaks are more prominent than others. So we can say, well, find me the most prominent peaks across a whole genre. So we can actually find what is the most interesting rap in all, all of hip hop. Um, and so we have this little interface there. We can uh, search based on prominence and, and, and find the most prominent uh, scrub two spot. So uh, for hip hop, this is the most prominent peak. I don't know if you're familiar with the song, but um, hey Fab, I'ma kill you. Lyrics coming at you with supersonic speed. Ah, uh, someone I'm a demon, I'm a you assume I'm a human. What I gotta do to get it through to you? I'm superhuman, innovative, and I made a rubber so that anything you say is sticking, shaking off of me and it'll glue to you and devastating more than ever. Demonstrating how to give a motherfucking audience a feeling like it's levitating, never fading, and I know the haters are forever waiting for the day that they can say I fell off to be celebrating because I know the way to get them motivated. I'm All right, so what do you think is the biggest drop, uh, quote unquote, from the 19th century? <laughs> and back then when we did the drop, it was with cannons, not with uh, <laughs> the bass. Uh, in classic rock, it's all about the guitar solo. <laughs> And so, what do you think is the greatest moment in classic rock? Take a moment to think about it. It may be controversial, I don't know. Uh, here it comes. All right, greatest scream in rock, you know what this is, right? All right, so the Rolling Stones, I was wondering, I, when I, I sort of looked at the song, I, I had in my mind what I thought would be the, the best part. It's my favorite part of the song, but I said, no, nah, I probably listen different than everybody else. And it's not the case. The favorite part of Gimme Shelter is when the backup singer's voice cracks. And it's amazing. That is, is uh, that little red dot is right at that moment. <laughs> So everyone loves uh, that. All right, yeah, I think. All right, uh, and for pop music, it's all about the chorus. Everyone loves this. All right, so that's hot spot. Um, why do we care? Well, all sorts of reasons. I I'm just looking forward to the day where we have a play me just the drop button on Spotify. <laughs> Coming soon. All right, now we're getting into the last bit of data. This is the acoustic data. This is treating our, uh, our music-like data. Um, and so how do we do this? So this is, uh, we do all sorts of things. We take audio, we can do signal processing on the audio, do machine learning around this, and we can extract all sorts of things like basic things like tempo, key, the mode. We can figure out how danceable a song is or how energetic it is or how loud it is. And we can also get a, a really good map of how, um, how uh, where all the beats are and the, and the bars and the tatums and things like this. And then we can use this to do all sorts of things, and all the next experiments are going to be driven off of that. Um, but I want to take a little step back, just start to think, before we had recorded music, how people used to listen to music. You were always in the same room with the musician. Uh, and this means that the listening session was much more interactive. You could have eye contact with the, the musician. You could uh, shout, play the chorus again. Uh, or you could sit down and join them, and depending on, on the venue. Um, so um, mu music listening was really, really interactive. Now compare that to today, how we listen to music. There's no interactivity at all except for a pause and play and maybe a little bit of scrubbing. Um, so we want to see if we can use some of this data to help make music listening a little bit more interactive. And some of these experiments will be around that. Um, all right, so first one is... Uh, trying to see is a human or a machine setting the tempo for your favorite song. So uh, recently, drummers have been putting on headphones and listening to click tracks when they set, set the, the, the beat. Um, and so uh, what we can do is, is try to figure out if the band you're listening to is actually using a click track or not. And this is a, a little app called In Search of the Click Track. 
And what this is showing is the variation in tempo over the course of the song. And you can sort of see uh, over the course of the song, we get some natural variations, four peaks. And this is because the, the, the band is speeding up and slowing, slowing down. So, um, and, and that's not necessarily because Stuart Copeland, the drummer for The Police is the Police song, uh, is a bad drummer. He's actually using the, the changes in tempo to add tension to the song and release and, and over. So let's take a little listen to hear what, what that sounds like. In this desert that I call my soul So we can do a little math and we can um, and see uh, this, there's definitely natural variation here in the tempo. So this is definitely a human drummer. Um, now let's look at another song. Uh, this is a song by Britney Spears. You can see it's perfectly flat is what it sounds like. <laughs> So no tempo variation, probably uh, a machine um, drumming and maybe even singing. Um. <laughs> All right. Sorry. I don't mean to disparage any artist. It's just a funny joke. <laughs> All right. So finding the most dramatic moments in music. So we, we looked at hot spots, finding the interesting moments, but I really am interested also in finding dramatic moments. I really love dramatic music, music that goes from a real quiet to a real loud in uh, 30 seconds or so. And so um, um, that's what this is. It's, uh, it's an app called Where's the Drama? Uh, and the idea is, is you only want to listen to the dramatic parts because that's the best part of the song. So uh, it will find the most dramatic bits just by looking at the, the loudness contour, highlight it, and you can hit the button and say, uh, play me the drama. And here's what it sounds like. <laughs> your lighter up there. All right. So, by the way, that's, I, I think Evanescence is Sam Fippins, uh, the, our, our spec guy's uh, favorite band, so I make sure we have lots of Evanescence examples. All right, um, so next one. This is uh, uh, something uh, built at a music hack day, sitting right next to Sam, by the way, um, and this is my attempt at doing something creative. So, yeah, I'm coding, but I think back to the time when I was a musician and I could, you know, touch somebody's emo emotionally. So, this is my attempt at doing this. So, since we know where all the bar and beats are and where the song gets exciting and where it, it falls off and where all the phrases are, we can do a very uh, much better visualization that go, accompanies the music, much better than sort of the VU meter kind of visualizations you may have seen in Winamp or something like that. So this is an app that's written in 3JS, runs in the browser, and it's really just an accompaniment for a song by Ellie Goulding. And just a, a, a small excerpt. <laughs>
um, after I, I built this hack and posted on the web, I, I realized um, uh, that I, had, uh, I was a 55-year-old man who had just created some Ellie Goulding fan art. <laughs> so I figured in for a penny, in for a pound. So I found my way to an Ellie Goulding uh, fan art site, which they ex apparently quite a few of them. But I found what I thought was the biggest one, crafted a forum post, and posted a link to there. And nobody liked it, so... All right, so next, automatically remixing your music. So, you know, a song is just a, a list of beats and bars and stuff. So what if you could manipulate these uh, lists of beats and bars just like you manipulate any lists in your programming language? And so that's what this remix uh, library is. Oh, look, Python code. Um, so yeah, it's, it's code. Um, so... <laughs> So it's uh, um, so here's an example of doing some uh, using a, a remix library. There's uh, uh, Python and JavaScript bindings for manipulating music uh, uh, algorithmically. So uh, here's a, a six-line uh, program that's going to take a song "Bad Romance" by Lady Gaga, uh, find the first beat in every bar, and render it out into a new song. And for those who can't read Python, I'll do a little visual for you. Take the first beats and line them up like that. All right. So. Uh, what's it sound like? <laughs> Sounds surprisingly musical, doesn't it? <laughs> what if you uh, did three lines of code to put those beats in, in reverse order? Sound like this? Well, it would look like this, sorry for the non-Pythoners. So I have this theory that you can put Lady Gaga in any order, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> So I, I have, um, I have uh, my youngest daughter, uh, she was listening to me prepare this talk, and she'd say, Dad, 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 do you like Lady Gaga? I'd say, yeah, I like some of her stuff, mainly the beat ones. And so, bad joke, sorry. All right, uh, next experiment now. So we know where all the beats are in a song. Well, let's see if we can improve a song by changing the drummer, and that's the idea behind the Bonhamizer. So, John... All right, so imagine... Uh, the idea here is that any song could be improved if John Bonham uh, were, was the drummer. So we know where all the beats are in a song. We have some outtakes from John Bonham, so we just need to align those beats uh, and let it play. Some tricks, because songs are never the same tempo. And the real trick is to make sure that the drums stop at the right time and start at the right time. Otherwise, it sounds just like a machine. So the idea here is, is to Bonhamize it. Here's a before, before, not Bonhamized. Some nights I stay up cashing in my bad luck. Some nights I call it a draw. All right, now bonhamized. Some nights I stay up cashing in my bad luck. Some nights I call it a draw. Some nights I wish that my lips could build a castle. Some nights I wish they just fall off. But I still wake up. I still see your ghost. Oh, Lord, I'm still not sure what I stand for. Oh, what do I stand for? What do I stand for? Most nights I don't know anymore. Anonymizer. This next song, uh, uh, hack is called Swinger. This is the only hack that I didn't write. It was written by Tristan Jahan, uh, who's um, uh, one of the founders of the Echo Nest, which is the company that got bought by Spotify and why I'm at Spotify. Um, so the idea here is to make your favorite song swing. So swinging a song is, you know, uh, instead of going dun 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 goes da 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 So you just need to stretch the first uh, part of the beat and shrink the last half and you get a nice swung song. So uh, let's hear what this sounds like. Here's Unswung. All right, here's a swung version. All right, that's a swinger. 
It's awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, this next one is called the Infinite Jukebox. This may be my most well-known hack. Any, who, who has ever heard of the Infinite Jukebox? Anybody? Yeah, a few people. All right. So the idea is of the Infinite Jukebox is for when your favorite song is not long enough. Uh, so you all have those songs you wish it would go on forever, and that's what the Infinite Jukebox does. And it does this, we know where all the beats are in the song, we know what the beats sound like, so we can find beats that actually sound very, very similar. So when we're playing back the song, and just, uh, instead of just playing back in sequential order, we can uh, jump to a similar sounding uh, beat. And we do this a little bit randomly, and so we end up with a song that plays forever, but it's always changing, so it's not just a symbol loop. So here, around the outside of the cir cir circle are all the beats. They're sort of colored by the timbres. And then the beats that sound most similar are connected up. And so as I play through the song, you'll see some of, sometimes it will flash green on those arcs, and that's when we're, we're jumping to a different part of the song. So here we go. So we just got two more to go. Um, so this next one, um, I'm particularly proud of this hack because um, it made me actually feel like I created something beautiful, um, which is something you very rarely get to do as a, as a programmer. Um, and this is called the auto canonizer. And the idea of the auto canonizer is to turn any song, well, maybe not any song, but lots of songs into a canon. So you know what a canon is? It's a song like Row, Row, Row Your Boat, where you can play it, uh, the song against uh, an offset copy of itself, and it sounds pleasant. So what the auto canonizer does is it plays the song straight through, but then it finds other parts of the song that would mesh well with the, uh, with the first voice uh, and tries to generate a, a pleasing version of the song. So in this example, we're going to be playing the song Over the Rainbow by the Hawaiian singer Is. Uh, and um, uh, so this is not a duet, but you'll hear him singing it as a duet. So we can make this deceased singer sing a duet with himself. So here's what it sounds like. I like the dark and the pink to myself. What a wonderful world. The colors and the brown stars so pretty up in the sky. That's the auto canonizer. Oh, All right. So that brings us to the final experiment. And this is called uh, Girl Talk in a Box. And the idea here is to turn a song into a musical instrument. Girl is a, a remix artist. Um, and so um, the idea is we can take a song, we can break it down into its beats, and then you can interact with it. It all runs in the browser. And I am going to attempt a live performance for you of... Oh, look. It. <laughs> that was just sitting in the background. Imagine it. I probably should have written some tests. <laughs> all right. I have no tests. So here's a song, Fancy featuring or whatever. So all, all these are the beats in the song and I can interact with this in all sorts of ways. So first of all, I can just sort of play the song. You see um, the colors change when I beat, but I can stop the song. I can make it play backwards. 
Or I could play it forward every other beat. First, I'm gonna really drop the whole world, feel it. Or I can just click around in different beats. This song's really, really rich. Every beat is filled with totally different sonic stuff, so it becomes a great musical instrument. So I can bookmark these things. I owe them a beer. Uh, all right, so I can bookmark things. All right, so that's how it works. So now I'm going to try to play it as a song. Here we go. This is it. I've practiced this quite a bit. And I'm doing this really because I've never performed in front of a thousand people before. <laughs> Even when I was playing trombone. <laughs> All right. And I'm quite nervous. More nervous about this than any other part of the, the day. And I'll screw it up. All right. Here we go. First things first, I'm the realest, realest, realest. Drop this and let the whole world feel it. Let them feel it. Let them feel it. I'm still in the murder business, I can hold you down, hold you down, like I'm giving lessons in physics, right, right, right. you should want a bad bitch like this, huh? drop it low and pick it up just like this, yeah, I'm so fancy, can't you taste this gold, remember my name, got to blow, oh, oh, I say, walk right down, no, walk right down, no, I should've get that, should've get that line of rewind, walk right down, no, hey, this got to score. All right, so you all got 30 million songs in your pocket, now what, right? So all this data um, that we've been collecting and using, it, we're really going to use that to improve the listening experience. Um, and just to generalize this for just a moment, um, so I'm really blessed to be able to work with the things that I love most, uh, music and code, but all of you are working in some domain, and I really strongly encourage you to hack on your data, get to know your data, love your data, play with it, do experiments with it, build crazy stuff. Uh, some of the stuff will just be crazy, but some of it actually becomes really, really useful. So uh, love your data, hack your data. So, thank you very much. Um, all of these experiments are online. Um, uh, you can go and try them out. So, you've been a great audience, and I'm, uh, special applause for our, our signers. Thank you.